Hi, this is Stuttering John Melendez from The Howard Stern Show. And for some really stupid reason, you're listening to... Insufferable Bastards. Great name for a podcast, morons. All right, speaking of people you don't want to hang out with, I happened to stumble across this show on YouTube called Insufferable Bastards. Hmm. The perfectly fun. Insufferable bastards. Those of you that are into podcasts like to listen to that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, you know. And hey, everybody. Welcome to Insufferable Bastards. It's Carlos Danger, and I'm joined by my co-host back after an extended absence, Mr. Brian Spears. Hello, hello. One mistake. We're the Insufferable Bastards now. What, what did I say, Mobile Horror Companion? Exactly. Oh, damn it, because you know what? I'm looking at my soundboard here, and it says mobile horror for this. Sorry about that. I will not edit that out. But, yeah, and then there's so much going on at the beginning there, because the reasons we have Stuttering John, right? And then we have Sir John. We have the two most well-known Johns probably in North America. Stuttering John from the formerly of the Howard Stern Show and Sir John from the Pina Comics Radio Hour. Not the podcast, the Radio Hour. It's very important to say that up front for legal reasons. But, so the way we got Stuttering John, it's not like we're buddies, but we did. he did a cameo for us. We paid him like 100 bucks, something like that, and he did it for when we were known as the Mobile Horror Companion. Hence, every time he says Mobile Horror Companion, I turn down his volume and I say insufferable bastards. And now, probably people, maybe there's one or two people out there wondering why we do that every week. That's why. And I don't think nowadays you can do uh, promotion. So, like get your yeah, promotion, yeah. Yeah, Cameo changed the rules. You you have to pay like big bucks now. And we have a bunch in the can. They all say Mobile Horror Companion. We got Debbie Rashone, Brian Posehn, the aforementioned Stuttering John, but maybe even a couple others. I tried to get Norm McDonald, but he never he never responded. You you also I think do you have high pitch Eric? I, we, I, I, yeah, high pitch Eric from Joe. Yeah, from that yeah. that was the original from our former co host Joe Greenberg, but. Uh, so this is our first, I, I guess the last one we did was a couple of weeks ago, because I did a solo 1883 review last week, and then I think I did the Batman maybe the week before. I don't know, Brian, how, how you been? You've been busy, right? You're, you're working on more I've been movies. busy. I'm working on stuff. I got a crazy schedule, and between our two schedules, it's hard to, to line up. Yeah, and sometimes it's just easier, like at least in the last month, it's easier just to, if I'm around, I have the equipment, I just rip out a, a solo episode and, and sometimes it's easier and quicker to do though though more boring so people have to have to take it i'm sorry but also this is the time of year like when i get busy like may is a very yep. it might as well be may right now even though it's not even april for all intents and purposes it's june 1st in my world so this is when we i don't know i'm not promising anything the next couple of weeks okay john amenta i might skip a couple of episodes I remember once we also I'm, have personal lives. That's the whole other thing. You, you know, saying I mean, Amenta doesn't. The, I, I feel that's a uh, that's a veiled that's a subconscious oh, sure. insult of John Amenta saying he doesn't have a personal life. How dare you? Where were you last night? Where was I? Where were you? I was home on the couch. Me too. You know where John yeah. Amenta was? Chilling uh, at the uh, Strand Theater in Seymour, Connecticut, watching Godzilla movies. He's got way more uh, of a personal life than, than than you and I. So I thought we would talk about three subjects real quickly in this year episode of Insufferable Bastards, formerly known as the Mobile Horror Companion, but not known as the Mobile Horror Companion anymore. We're going to talk about, first of all, Glass Eye Picks is this independent, truly independent New York City area studio, right? Is that right? A studio? Production company, call production them, or, company. Yeah, yeah, a boutique. Nowadays, you would call them a boutique uh, production company. They have a, a retrospective of sorts. I guess that's a right word for it. They're headed by Larry Fezzedin. It's Larry Fezzedin's company, right? He's been the creative guy and putting together uh, movies and I guess lining up, working with producers to line up financing for all these independent movies that have really made their mark, I'd say, over the last 10, 15, 20 years because you've got a lot, they, they were they were the uh, breeding ground, I guess, or the spawning ground of Ty West. Ty uh, West, who has X out right now. Jim Mickle is doing Sweet Tooth on, uh, is it Netflix? So uh, all those guys kind of got their, you know, had a run at uh, Glass Eye. So it's been interesting. And Brian was 
in the mix of all that when all these movies were being filmed because you worked on on a bunch of them brian does special effects makeup right it was you you and pete gurner right yep yep and i even did a couple movies by myself but yeah there was a whole bunch a whole slew of their movies starting with i sell the dead that i uh i was lucky enough to participate in they're very uh artistically friendly a real good group to work with they're they're smart man's horror and if anything now i'm a little angry now i get bitter because it seems their movies i wish they came out now they were ahead of the time they, i think they were yeah. definitely ahead of their time they were a24 before it was cool to be a24 a24 has way more money than glass eye but glass eye never let the money get in the way and I can't speak of like, you know, they're, you know, I don't, I'm the, the effects guy. I toss blood on set, but I, I do know they genuinely work their asses off to make good movies and however they have to get them done. And just as, a, as the, the, the white trash part of this uh, podcast, me being Carlos Danger, I did go with Brian one time. I was so excited. It's my one IMDb credit. I still, I bring it up once a week to people. Uh, we went to Brooklyn, right? And this was like, I had been to Brooklyn. A long time ago, before Brooklyn was hipster Brooklyn, like when Brooklyn was still kind of like Rockaway and Far Rockaway, when it was still kind of, you know, a a place, if you weren't from there, you had to be careful because you needed to know where to go and where not to go. Then I went back with Brian, right? And uh, it was the the viewer, right? It the was, viewer, it Graham was a, Resnick. Graham Resnick, who's a sound guy, who does the sound, I believe, on X, the new Ty West yep. directed yep. movie. He was directing this short film called The Viewer in 3D. Now, my thing was, I thought it was going to be like Animal House. I'm like, we're heading to Brooklyn, right? What do I know about Brooklyn? It's like, this is where uh, Zach Galifianakis uh, hangs out on the street corner, you know, reading poetry and and smoking doobies and all that good stuff. And I thought it would be like a lost weekend, right? I was like, I don't know if I'm coming home, wife. Not sure. I don't even know if I was married then. It might have been. It was a long time ago. But it was the opposite. Yeah, you sit around a lot, right? Uh, well, not only we, there was a hell of a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I had never been really on a movie set. You know, I mean, as a reporter, I like, you know, kind of was, but not really. But to be in there and to see all the hard work and then how the professionalism of everybody, everything, they, they took care in everything, like a, every part of that room, everything that was going to be in on camera. I was really impressed. And and I think that that's the whole glass eye picks uh, motivation. I think they're really, they really care. They care about everything and it'll probably they, starting they with do. the story. So there was yeah. nothing, it wasn't like they were just throwing things on or doing like a, a cheapy, uh, slasher flick. I mean, there's a place for that, but they were, these guys are real artists and, uh, it totally took me aback and I was exhausted by the end of the day, like totally, totally washed out, uh, and wanting to get out of there really bad. And I remember it was a long day. Of it was physical, a long, very long day, a very, very long labor. Day. Yeah. So and uh, and that was only a short film. So we only like they only needed us one day. They shot everything in like two days. I remember there was a dude with a long beard. It was, you know, like when beards were first becoming really in like the it is Brooklyn. Yeah, it was Brooklyn. And he he just bought like I don't know what he was reading. He he brought some kind of book. It was like it looked like, you know, those like story or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it it was when I worked when I worked in newspapers, there was always the comically large dictionary in every newsroom that nobody really used but it was just there on a table gathering dust he had like a copy of that and he was just reading through it which was not pretentious at all all right so let's talk about brian real quick here because this is cool i mean the fact that larry i do believe just so you know there that this was planned i think pre-pandemic because i think it was either 30 or 35 years of glass side picks Oh, so okay. I think this was like supposed to be a re- retrospective that they have long wanted to do. And now it's finally coming out just because it's, you know, the environment we're in now is a little bit safer. Yeah. So, oh, wow. It starts like we're, we're recording this on March 27th. Yeah, we're putting this out right in time oh, yeah. for this to come out. And it starts March 30th, the 30th. The first one they're going to show is Depraved, of course, di- directed by Larry Fezzedin, Brian did the the uh, what did you do on that? I want to misstate it. I was it's a it's a, a retelling of Frankenstein. So we did the Frankenstein's monster, and so that's at four o'clock March thirtieth, and then at seven o'clock, uh, I believe, is this Larry's first movie? Larry Fezzedin's first movie, Habit, the famous. It's uh, one York's- of it's it's probably his second or third, but it's my I, it's probably one of if you're a Larry fan, it's kind of the 
the favorite of Larry's. It's like a, another modern telling of like a vampire type like tale. And the parallel story, it's about drug addiction, right? It's kind of about yeah, substance drug, abuse, or, what I remember. Yeah, substance abuse, alcohol, that type of thing, yeah. So that's March 30th. I won't go through the whole list. And then the next day, it, and these are all like, you can go to either Glass Eye Picks on social media. Brian actually posted on the Insufferable Podcast Facebook page. He has the whole calendar laid out there. Or, and this is all at the Museum of Modern Modern Art uh, in New York City, right? That's West 53rd Street. On the 31st, we got River of Grass, which I don't, I'm not familiar with that one. That's a, another, that's a, um, I'm going to mask Kelly name, Reich, Kelly, Reich Reich yeah. Reich yes, Hart? yes, yes. She's a frequent collaborator of uh, Larry's. And, and then Glass Wendy Eyes. and Lucy. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Okay, yeah, so it's yeah. they're doing her two films. And then on April 1st, we got Wendigo and the Last Winter, two more Larry Fezzedin movies. Then it looks like, is this Saturday? Is April? Yes, Saturday, April 2nd, you got a 1.30 Bitter Feast, yeah. which uh, Brian worked on. That's a great movie of Chef who takes a critic hostage, right, from what I yep, remember? Yep, That's yep. a good one. It's, it's Glass Eye's answer to... Uh... To torture porn back in the day, like when Hostel was coming out, and then Stray Bullets. Uh, that is uh, Jack Fezzedin, Larry Sons movie. Oh no, kidding! Okay, did yeah, you work yeah, on that one little, too? Didn't you do? I couple? did. I did a couple days on that. My niece actually appears in it. Oh in no, a kidding. couple crowded scenes. She got to hang out with Kevin Corrigan all day, so she was super excited, and she was like a little kid. And then and he was really really cool with her. That's uh, I another, think that's the premiere. Another, that's oh, a Jack. Okay. That's a Jack Fezzanin movie. As so that's well. that's pretty cool. And then just I'll just I'll just run through these and, and please go to the uh, MoMA website or Glass Eye Picks, or if those are too challenging, go to the Insufferable Podcast Facebook page and the the whole list is right there. No telling beneath which Brian worked on House of the yeah. Devil, the Innkeepers. Those are the Ty West films. Brian worked on the Innkeepers. Oh, they spelled Innkeepers wrong. Damn you, MoMA. Then Wendy and, and the Lucy. Innkeepers was filmed in Connecticut in uh, the, the Yankee Peddler. The Yankee Peddler and the now closed Yankee Peddler Inn way up in Torrington. That was the hotel I had my wedding party stay at yes. uh, when I got married back in the day. And then a couple other. I mean, the Ranger that Brian worked on, Jen Weckler directed. Uh, then the, going back, I'm going to say this wrong. Automatons. Yes. O o yeah. And then I can see you. Unfortunately, that's the Graham Resnick movie. I don't see the viewer on here as one of the, uh, uh maybe, maybe no. there's a trailer. Maybe before I can see you, they'll play uh, my one IMDB credit. And then Friday night, this is a big one. This is, uh, movies, two movies on, on April 8th that I've mentioned many times in the past uh, of this podcast when we were Mobile Horror Companion and now Insufferable Bastards. At 4 o'clock, Stakeland, directed by Jim Mickle, a great neo-Western neo vampire flick, I'm going to call it. And then at 6.30, the first movie that Brian did with Glass Eye Picks, I Sell the Dead, directed by Glenn McQuaid, Angus Scrim. Who else is in that? Their name's escaping me. Dominic Ron, Monaghan. Ron Perlman. Ron Perlman. And there we go. That's a great movie. I saw that in the theater with Brian at its premiere, I think. I don't remember yep. all of it. We went to the premiere at IFC. So I won't go, you know, and that's pretty much the lineup. And they, they play all month. This is going on from March 30th until April 19th. It closes with the comedy, which is uh, directed Tim by- Tim Heidecker? Rick, yeah, directed by uh, Rick Alverson. And that's- uh, Sort of the uh, the high point of uh, really cringy pseudo comedies. They're funny, but they're yeah, not kind of yeah, funny. They kind yeah, of uh, yeah. that that kind of introduced the world or the whole concept of what is going on with Danny McBride and and like the righteous gemstones. Yes. It's all it's all that and, kind uh, of comedy. I didn't do much on that, but I do know uh, I did a little wound and a bruise and like very little, but. Uh, I think Tim Heidecker at the time was a huge. Uh, he's like a Stern fan, or was a. I'm not oh. saying you know. And uh, it, he knew, uh, I, I guess that I he found out that I did Richard Christie's Halloween makeup. So we had a little quick chat about that. So oh, that that's awesome. Cool. That's yeah. Awesome. So that was kind of cool. And he's, of course, from what the uh, Adult Swim. Uh, yep. The, 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 uh, we're from the name of his Tim and Eric, right? <laughs> Tim right. and Eric. Yeah. 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 This is so embarrassing. So congratulations to you, Brian, for having all those movies playing at MoMA. That is an accomplishment. It is really cool. The only I'm going <laughs> to complain about i have to complain a little bit because well, it would course. be the insufferable bad yeah right right i just wish they were a little bit better in time uh 
Like four o'clock is really, I have a job. I guess cinephiles don't have jobs. Well, so that's my only, here's my, that's my only complaint. I'm going to put a, I'm going to put the silver lining on here as the, uh, as the more positive guy in insufferable bastards, right? The, uh, these fucking superhero movies, the, I'm going to say that. All right. So a lot of the audience for this might be college students, uh, film yeah. students who are now, you know, school of visual arts, NYU, all those, whatever else is going on in uh, New York city. I don't know. I'm 48 years old. I live in Derby, Connecticut. I record this in my basement, but maybe this is a way to expose it to, uh, to the next generation, to the younger generation. Yes. To get, I, I agree with you. And I think I'm just know. more like, Oh, I just wish. Cause there's so I don't live, you know, I can't take a subway to the city. So it's it's a little bit I because there's so many of these movies that I, I would love to watch with a crowd again. Mm. And, yeah, but I'm, I'm very happy that myself. they're out there. I, I'm very happy they're out there. I mean, the, uh, you know, Stakeland, I sell the dead. Those the, what little career I have I those two movies mean the world to me in a sense that it it brought me into this glass eye family. And I'm really, really proud of everything we did on that move. Those movies. I've been on movies where they talk about the sequel before we filmed the first day. And, you know, oh, it's gotcha. like you can't do that kind of stuff. You know what I mean? And also, I had it input. Sometimes, you know, you just show up and you're asked to do this and you do your job. And I have no problem with that. And, and the ham and egg in it is exactly right. This, at least I had a say. I had input. I had, I felt like I was part of the process. Now I'm kind of a cog in the system, which I'm not going to complain about. And which you know, needs I, to happen because these, those are yes. bigger productions. They have to yes. have a, a system in place so things get done. But Glass Eye Picks was more more loose and a little more I got to be the yeah. pretentious artist. I got to be a pretentious artist. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm we trying go. to say? So it was kind of cool. So uh, the other thing I'll add about Glass Eye Picks, I mean, heck, this could be the whole episode. We don't have to go on and talk about anything else. But... You know, Brian and I have been to a kajillion horror conventions. And before horror conventions just became about waiting online for yeah. autographs. So there, there was a time where it wasn't about collectibles and spending all this money. And, it was about community. And, right. And increasing the, the value of your poster because you had so many people uh, sign it. And I, I mean, that's all good to a point. But I just think horror conventions have just become that. But... We had so much fun that time. I don't know what Glass Eye Picks was at a Fangoria show, right? They were they, at a couple of them. We went, we hung out with them before I even worked with them at a New Jersey one when it was, I think, Chiller and Fango. And we with like Ron, Ron Perlman, Perlman, right? Yeah. Yeah. But, Ron Perlman and Glenn McQuaid were there, but we kind of like we knew, well, we definitely knew Ron Perlman. But here's the thing, and maybe I'm talking out of school here. Yeah. Cause I remember that distinctly because it was 12 p.m. and there was only like two groups of people at the bar it was yeah. the people brian was with and then glass eye picks <laughs> yeah <laughs> that was then years later you work with them and we hung out it was like and we took them back to our room and got them uh, drinks our room that was, was in like, new york city we were, it was like was the that? green room our no no yeah. i think that was jersey i think no, it was, that yeah it was jersey it was again and we were upstairs yeah 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 a uh, fangori weekend of horrors i think it was yeah uh and that was it was fun. I, I guess they had like, there was like a younger producer there who ended up, we ended up, we had to get carried out. It was just great. Oh, yeah. You oh, yeah. You couldn't yeah ask, we had a lot of fun. You couldn't ask for a better time. So not only these guys, uh, good filmmakers and Larry Fezzenes has launched the career. You know, he's like the A24 Roger Corman. You know what I mean? Like he, he, he they, they're instead of like starting in terrible movies, they started in really good movies. And well, that's the other to thing. Like more good movies. I've, I'm very, very, very lucky. Listen, I got a three page article, which would, to me was a big deal in Fangoria because of my work in Glass Eye, you know, so I will forever be grateful to Glass Eye. And again, it's led to everything else and people that have seen those movies. I once did a, a movie with Bobby Moynihan, very small, like he was an SNL cast member. And he was talking about I Sell the Dead when I was in the makeup room working on another make a thing. And I said, Hey, you know, that movie. And he's like, Oh yeah, I just watched it this weekend. And it was, Oh no, that's kidding. really cool. So that's like, you know, and again, I've worked with other makeup artists, uh, you know, that have said like, wow, we really loved your stuff in that and guys that I admire. Um, so it's been, you know, it's been a very good, it's been very good to me. And Larry, like, I've always felt like family. 
Yeah, like it's, and I'm really happy. We probably could have got him on. This. Let's call him up. You got his number? We should, we should have a guest. <laughs> Why are we talking about this? <laughs> right? Let me could throw it in Johnny Amenta's face, Pina Comics, who has a who has a uh, Patreon, by the way, which I support, and you should, everybody should too. Go, go, uh, give uh, two bucks to Pina Comics. They're doing some good stuff. Not as good as this, but all right. So that's that. That's glass eye picks. So the other thing I wanted to touch upon real, real quick, Brian, I sent you, there's this great article. I was like growing up and you were too, we were fans of like the movie magazines when they were like entertainment journalism was a real thing. And they would go on set in like a premiere magazine and maybe they would detail the troubles that a certain movie was having, you know, like there was like more fascinated. Yeah. I'm fascinated. Like half the bad movies I like are because of how they got made. Bonfire the Vanity is probably the most yes. famous. They wrote yeah. a whole book, or she, the author, wrote a whole uh, book about it. So you, you see that every once in a while, but it's, you know, now the studios and the stars just have Twitter, social media. They don't need independent journalists to go in there and no. possibly muck stuff up and get the messaging wrong. But every once in a while, you know, like when Paul Schrader invited somebody from the New York Times on to, to detail the... Ma- I, Paul Schrader, by the way, National Treasure. Best thing on Facebook is, is Also, Paul follow him on Facebook. Holy cow, he's the, best. the guy. He's so good. He's so good. So he Listen, let, he, you're going to get offended, but yeah, he's, he's so good. He's all over the place. Yeah, yeah. He might, you know, you don't know what he's going to post at two in the morning, but it's it's entertaining. Uh, but he invited a, a reporter in for his movie, The Canyons, with uh, yep. uh, Lindsay Lohan and James Dean, and that was fascinating. So the Hollywood Reporter, let me see if I can bring it up here. On March 24th, I believe it was, published an article called The Real Mission Impossible Saying No to Tom Cruise, and it's by Kim Masters. And it's a great read. Okay, now you, you see that he- headline. Now it's impossible. This thing is like, it's like a freaking 2,000 word story. So it's impossible mm-hmm. to get the entire context and, and everything that's in the story into one headline. So, and people don't get that anymore. You know what I mean? Because they'll call this clickbait. It's not clickbait, but the story really is about you got Tom Cruise, who is the biggest star in the world, right? He is, he is the star of stars at the moment. He can get a movie made. He can get almost unlimited funds for a movie. Yep. And he, you got to say he is Paramount. Like right. that's the, the company they're talking about now. He's had like a 30 year career with them. Yeah, it's it, it's really fascinating. So the story is about the filming of Mission Impossible 7, which is just I can't believe there's a Mission Impossible 7. But it's about how. Tom Cruise, sort of the business, right? Tom Cruise, the brand, has collided with COVID because the movie's been delayed something like seven times because of I COVID. I think eight times. I think eight so, times it said in the article. Like an incredible, yeah. And yes. then you've got, since, oh, sorry, that's a sound for my computer. Sorry about that. My screen time was up 43% last week. So you got Tom Cruise, the brand, colliding with COVID, and then those two things are colliding with the fact that since COVID began, I mean, this movie sort of coincides with the beginning of, of, of COVID and the pandemic, the whole business model has essentially changed, where you've yep. had this incredible push, the sea change to streaming. Yes, they want this to, I think the big controversy is they want the movie would be in theaters for 45 days. And Tom Cruise, he has a contract that says, no, 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 three months no, minimum. No, three months minimum. So he's lawyered up, according to the article, and there's all this. Uh, then you have the fact that, according to the article, and this is clearly people who are pissed off at Tom Cruise speaking about this, because this, they're like the sources. They're saying, look, Tom Cruise and Christopher McQuarrie, director of The Great Way of the Gun, right? The underrated mm-hmm. uh, classic shoot 'em up They're basically running wild to a certain extent. They, they have this thing where they're filming Mission Impossible 7, but sort of contractually, they did this move where they started filming Mission Impossible 8. 8, <laughs> So yeah. they can't be stopped. So the studio, you know, the suits are obviously, it's old school, tearing their hair out. And, and you know, and, and I think in the article it says, which is hilarious, that 7 was pretty much wrapped. But now they're adding a whole new they're, scene in 7 like, that should have been in 8. We need submarines. Yeah, they did this whole sequence. They brought in a submarine. So, it, yeah, the, I think the budget for 7 is, is up to like $300 million. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's entertaining to read about, but it's also just a fascinating look at the way uh, movies hey, are being made Can I just say now. one thing? One thing is, I believe they mentioned a guy, Brian Robbins. He is now in charge of Paramount or high up in Paramount. Brian Robbins 
if it's the same Brian Robbins and he does say he had Nickelodeon credits and he was a, a TV star, he was in head of the class and he's director of varsity blues. Oh, wow. And, I didn't even, and, okay. And not, not, uh, what was Good Burger? He directed Good Burger. Oh, sure. That's another Nickelodeon. Yeah, they do mention yeah. in this article that he has this thing where he got the blue, uh, not the Blues Clues, Paw Patrol, which pa- is a Nickel- Paw Patrol. Nickel- he got the Paw Patrol movie made and he put that on Paramount Plus because the animated uh, actors wouldn't talk back to him like Tom Cruise does. So it's just fascinating because just, just the fact that on the filming of this one movie has taken so long, the business model has changed underneath it. Yes. And Tom Cruise is like, oh, wait a second. It's just it's a really good article and I highly recommend it. And they bring up the fact, you know, COVID plays a major part. You know, this was in the beginning of COVID where there was the leaked argument with the uh, Cruise yelling at the crew, mm. which at the time he was like, hey, go. Everyone was for Tom Cruise because, hey, we want to make movies. This is giving everyone a job. But it also says like they just chased different countries that would let them kind of like be lax on the protocol rules. They, yeah, they were getting like, all these exemptions because they were bringing yeah. in all this tax dollars. And they, yeah, they were totally. Like, and it hustling. also kind of says, you know, unconfirmed, but still like that. Maybe they him and Corey both got covid, but never admitted to covid. Maybe they weren't vaccinated at the time. Like there's all this like there's a little gr- bit of conspiracy there's some gray there. areas and Cruz yeah. allegedly had some other type of medical ailment going on early and then and then they, oh then the whole thing is okay so this the the this studio was trying desperately to get this mega movie done and but COVID hits and it's something no one's ever experienced so it's shut down they're going to another country shut down again this guy's got COVID Tom Cruise family apparently has COVID at one point the director is hospitalized with COVID at one point insurance company no we're not paying for any of that so there's nope, a lawsuit. I mean, God, the money. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. It's just fascinating to see this push to stream streaming happening so quickly. I think much uh, faster than anybody would would have anticipated. And just the amount of money involved. Like, this is something that could bring down a studio. I mean, can I go? Yeah, I know everyone loves movie theaters, but there was (laughs) that time where like movies, you know, you paid a little extra, but you could get them at home. And now that like even the 40 now it's hard for me to wait 45 days because I'm like, oh, come on. I wish I would watch Batman right now. If I could watch, I'd pay 20 bucks if I could watch it at home. I'm going to let you get in on something the other day with my nephew. I rented because he was dying to see it. The new Spider-Man. And I let me just interrupt you. That's the best. That's according to everybody. That's the best movie of 2021. Oh, my God. They're so are, are they all eight, nine year olds <laughs> in fourth grade? Because holy crap, I will say this. I, I will say not to interrupt the, the, this flow of conversation, okay. but I I won't say I hated the movie because I watched it with somebody that was so excited and was talking to me that must have been on YouTube and was like, wait till you see this thing. Like the, his exuberance brought me into the movie, but it's a piece, you know, come on, man. Come on, man. But, wait, wait, it's, but Brian, there's, uh, there's three Spider-Men in the movie. It's from the guy from that Spider-Man and then yeah, the guy nobody liked know. the Spider-Man. It made no sense. And you know what? There was that cartoon. The the Morales, the Mike, uh, you know, whatever, the end of the Spider-Verse. Oh, yeah. Miles Morales. Yeah, that that was movie good. was great. That, that was, was good. great. Yeah. This just rips that off. It just doesn't do it as well. That's and, what I don't get you know, either. That's what I don't get. When everybody, when the spoilers were coming out, and they're like, oh my God, the Spider-Man are together. I'm like, wasn't that in that movie? Because I saw that in the theater too. And it was the same type of thing. And I totally get what you mean about how kids' exuberance can get you into that. And you know, it's just scary though. I guess that's happening to grown men as well though. Grown men but that's watching what's the same scary. videos. I, like, listen, as when an I, eight-year-old. I know we got, you know, in some trouble in the past like because i think this was even on a couple guys when we asked for top 10 lists or their top movies of the year and this might have been on one or two of the lists that we got when we did the best of yeah dude it is not a best of movie anyone that says that i don't know get your eyes checked i listen your taste it's a super, sucks it's oh, you a froze. superhero movie i get it it's like no, oh it's a superhero movie i get the nostalgic i get some of it but it's a kid's movie well, I, yeah, that brings me to a whole other thing. Cause like my kid has started to watch my son. He's 11. He's starting to watch. And it sounds maybe rock is doing the same thing. There's these, there's YouTube reviewers, YouTube yes. movie critics, right? They're guys like in their twenties and thirties and they, but they specialize in reviewing like, you know, the big, the biggest movies of the day. Like they'll do two or three videos on Spider-Man. They're not necessarily fanboys, but they're like, they're the worst critics ever. Like they have no, 
I don't know. Like there, if you watch the, if you ask the guy, like, what are your top three movies? It's like Home Alone, Back to the Future, and Spider Man Nine. And I'm just like, well, I don't know. I don't trust your, your taste. Sucks. So many people have shitty tastes, but you're not allowed to say that anymore. You're not allowed to say like, no, it's no. not personal, but I think your taste sucks, and I wouldn't trust what you say about any movie because your taste sucks. You think also, Home Alone's the best movie? Are you kidding me? Also, I guess what else? Chris bothers Stuckman. Me is that's like, the guy's name. Chris Stuckman. I'm specifically talking about this guy named Chris Stuckman, who has like his also, videos get like two, two to five million views of a freaking video. Son of a. Bitch. I also think, and again, I know maybe we're changing our subject now because what we're we also discussed. Maybe we'll talk about what we're watching. Yeah. The problem I have with right now is all these superhero like grow up. That's all. Like, don't you want some adult material? And I don't mean sure. adult in the way that you're like, I don't mean in the way adult means to those comic book guys. No, I'm not talking about dirty movies. Try something different. Will. Yeah. It's like, I don't want the same thing I got when I was a kid. Like, and, and there's I, like 19 of them at this point. There's been 19 of them in the last like three years. Stop it. And, and they're getting so fantastical. Also, that's the other thing that took me out of like a Spider-Man movie. There's that Dr. Strange guy. Yes. And it gets all inception. Like, yes. and I don't get any of this this fantastical aliens other worlds doctor like i doctor strange makes it? me nuts doctor strange Spider-Man. exists he exists he is just a plot device so they can break any rules of their universe doctor yes. strange exists just so oh well you don't have we've run out of ideas guys what if we recycle this what if we have a new spider-man oh okay D- doctor strange is the worst fictional character in the history of anything oh it's driving me nuts man because it takes me out of the movie and it makes also like I thought Spider-Man for all those guys that love and grew up on Spider-Man, I respect you in a way, but wasn't Spider-Man about like a kid in Queens dealing with life. It was a metaphor and he's a superhero like, you know, and he's, but he's dealing with normal problems. Like, wasn't that the fascination with Marvel that it was grounded in reality from what I was always told as a kid, oh, you got to read this because it's about this, but it's really grounded in reality. Well, now, now nothing's in reality. I don't understand how buildings move. It literally turned into Inception right. you, in the you, middle of the movie. You're better off just playing a video game. The video games are much more entertaining. You're they're interactive. You get to be Spider Man. If you, if your whole boyhood fantasy, you know, infantile brain thing is just to be Spider Man, just play the video game. Spare us yeah. these, these movies. They're so repetitive. When I went and saw the Batman with my son. One of the previews was for Sam Raimi's Doctor Strange in the yeah. Mad, Madhouse Multiverse, Mama Ma, whatever the heck it is. And I don't know, the movie looked like it looked completely interchangeable with the last 19 Marvel movies. I don't understand what I'm supposed to. How are you getting excited for this? I don't get and, that. And I don't care. Let, listen, people have been like, oh, Sam Raimi's directing a new Marvel. I don't give a crap. Sam Raimi, direct the gift and uh, a simple plan. Those are the those are two great Sam Raimi movies. But I love the Evil Dead movies. Yeah. But I don't need to see him make a friggin' Marvel movie again, you know? Like, it's not like you don't have any say in anything. It's all a committee, anyways. Right. I feel That's like- the problem with Marvel. They're com- like, or right. any, I'm not just saying Marvel. I'm saying all these IP movies. I don't want to just, because I want to say Star Wars. I want to say DC. They're all made by committee. And I'm just not part of that committee. I'm not, it's not my. Yeah, it's not like the director's vision. I see some of these no. reviews for the Marvel movies where people are like, well, this director brought this. To-. It's like, what? What are you talking about? I mean, there's no, there's no vision. The last guy that brought any kind of vision to one of these Marvel movies, and again, I'm not thinking about this before I say it, so I'll just say it anyway, was Ang Lee with that awful Hulk movie that he made. <laughs> At least that kind of felt like, oh yeah, it's Ang Lee. That guy makes it's boring Lee, movies yeah. and he yeah. made a boring superhero movie. I get that. All right, that was his vision. But Sam Raimi, it's just like, okay, he's got to get a big paycheck and god bless him but i don't i i, I don't know there, it depresses me but then I mean, the other thing that's interesting and it's going back to that tom cruise thing this whole thing where the studio in their dispute with Cruz, said like look tom and i'm totally paraphrasing and then and then embellishing this look tom these movies only have a 45 day when that's that's the only time yep. you're making money that the, yep. the whole nation has add they only go to the theater in those first four weeks and then after that it's, there's no point even having it in the theater because we can just put it on streaming and make our make the same amount of money, possibly more. And that's what I mean by the whole the the way the whole the whole thing has changed. Because yeah, I mean that's the whole thing now. It's the only thing that's going to be left in theaters, and clearly, it's just these big these big Spider Man movies. That's you, yep. you know you get you put that out. We all we all we all can pay attention for four weeks, and then you got to give us Avengers 
19. And then you got to give us Black Widow four weeks later. And that's it. It's just like one movie per month. That's all we can handle. So streaming more and more uh, is the way. So there is no longer that summer movie that comes out in May, the end of May and lasts all summer that you can't wait to see. There's right. not it just doesn't exist oh, anymore. Or the or like the, the late one that they kind of dump because they're not in August that they're not really sure about. Because yeah. sometimes you get some gems out of that. You know, you get like a state of grace, you know, or even a Goodfellas a was Goodfellas, sort of yeah. released like that. But those those are like that's done. That's going. that's done. Those those movies. I hate to say it will always be uh, you're not going to see though. Those are going to be either on a platform TV, you know, these platform new platforms or it's going, you know, to a smaller spectrum. And that's the other thing. There's no DVD market anymore either. That's you know what too, I mean? So yeah. so that's dead. It's all this streaming. So you're, you're at the mercy of when they put things out and who puts it out. You know what we should do is uh, ask Bill Burr for a comment. These fucking superhero movies. How many fucking more can they do? <laughs> yeah, thank you. I forgot to do that at the beginning of our We Hate Marvel segment. All right, so finally we'll talk about, I guess, we're 41 minutes into this. Let's talk about what we've been watching uh, lately. But let me, I just have some random clips. I don't even know what this is. Hey, mister, do you want some dope? Uh, I say dope. Do you want any? You have elephant? Huh? You have Ming Toy Dog? Huh? I guess you don't. That was the great Charles Bronson being uh, offered <laughs> drugs by a street salesman uh, in some South American country in 1984. Evil that men do. All right. So I'll just say <clears throat> we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I was a little eh on it. You were more gung ho about it. But now I've been converted to your stance. One of the best things, one of, I think there's two great shows on television. One of them is, I didn't even bother to look up the name, the Laker one, whatever the hell that is called on HBO. Winning season or winning time. It's winning something. <laughs> Let me go look it up. You I just call this, it right? the Lakers show. The, yeah, yeah the, thing, I love, the John C. Riley Lakers show. It's, it's amazing right now. And you don't need to know anything really about basketball. It's great to watch. Winning and I time, think the rise time. of the Lakers dynasty. Winning time. It is so good and it's funny. It's irreverent. This is what I'm talking about. This is adult TV. This is HBO said, F you, Netflix. We're coming back. Like, because I, I think I like Netflix now did great for a couple of years there where they had incredible original programming. A lot of it was some by, by David Fincher. Uh, but like now they're getting into a little like, hey, let's compete with the Marvel True. world. Let's it, and yep. HBO, I'm not going to lie. Like I, there was an era there that I kind of was fading out of. Yep. It was the girls era and it has nothing to do with the girl, like girls, the show, but that whole taste is know, taste self too. Like, yeah, taste yeah. Is, like we, everyone has to defend their taste. Now you can't like say I didn't like girls without being yeah. called whatever. But yeah, I mean, I, I just, I get yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. Because I'm going to also talk about another show on HBO, which I think is, if you're going to call like girls like a woke show, there's another incredible show on HBO that I think is genius. It's woke. It's something I'm proud to watch. I think it's really good and it's funny. And it it it, uh, it makes you think when you're done watching it. It's really good. It's called The Minx. I don't know if you're watching. It's sort of a uh, uh, feminist I just fast version. forward for some of the dirty scenes. And I was like, <laughs> All right, but, but I'll have to go back. I think it's hilarious. I think it's really good. I also think I'm 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 hungry for this adult content. You know, I'm and again, we should for, we should we should point out the Minx is 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 adult in, in several ways because it's all, in it's several ways. A, oh, yeah. yeah. A men's magazine like. Uh, yes. And there's sort a, of I will not lie. There's a lot of man junk. So if you have an issue with that, that's the Sam whole trend. Elliott, that's you're the whole not going to you're not going to dig it. But it's a very well written show. And I think that's what's smart. And that's exactly what this Lakers show. They're both. They're all well written. It all starts with the story and the characters that you care about. Yeah, the the Lakers show. Wait, what is it called? Winning. Is that what winning it's called? Winning. Season. Winning time. Winning time. Winning time. Why didn't they call it Showtime? It would be like because everybody remembers yeah. the show. I mean, this I do because we were kids. So I mean, the Lakers were yeah. a big deal in the eighties. So that's when we were watching. Last time I watched sports, but yeah, it propels you, man. Like at first, I was a little off put by they're constantly breaking the fourth wall and looking to the camera. But that I've gotten used to that. And uh, I mean, it kind of reminds me the way like Goodfellas goes through the the uh, the, the the kitchen leading out yep. to uh, the performance there, that famous scene. This show kind of has that vibe. It's always moving forward. I don't mean literally like camera movement, but I just mean it's got a good story. It's telling it really well. 
all the performances are great. I mean, there, there's a guy portraying Magic Johnson. If that guy doesn't get every Emmy there is, yeah. he's portraying one of the most well-known basketball players of all time, and he is completely believable. You completely believe it. Because so many times when it's somebody that famous, it just, you know, the biopic comes across as cheesy because it's like, oh, yeah, I remember this guy. Oh, they Almost just, parody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, they'll throw on some stupid makeup to make him look like that. But this is just everything works. John C. Riley is great. He's funny. Holy he's desperate. cow, is he good. He is so and, good in this. And the, the I am completely shocked by... Jason Clark as Jerry West. It's I mean, Jerry West. Jason yeah. Clark's a great actor. He's 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 been sort of like this. He's one of our great character actors, right? He's he's just and, and never given good. a role. Never. I, I think this is his strongest role to date. In the sense that, like, I've never seen him in anything. Like, I, we always knew he was a good actor, and he's done a lot of stuff, and he's been in a lot of franchise stuff, a lot of IP stuff, even. But he was in this TV show called Brother a Brotherhood. It was a oh, Showtime yeah. show about a Rhode Island uh, mob connected family. Uh, but if anything, he is so good in this. Also, I thought he kind of lost it. But last week's episode, Adrian Brody is That's a right. surprise Adrian, to me. Adrian Brody like, shows up as Pat Riley again. What I mean, if you're if you're our age, we're 48. Like Pat Riley is is ingrained in your brain. Yes. If you were alive in the 80s. And yeah, I was kind of like, oh, I don't this, and it's working because, it, and that's just, a, I guess, a testament to his acting and the, and and I guess the script, everything about the show is great. You should definitely watch it. Isaiah uh, Quincy Isaiah is the guy who plays yeah. Magic Johnson. He's great. And yeah, I never thought I would be so enthralled by freaking Jerry West, you know. And I had no <laughs> idea about any of the back. I mean, I don't know any of the backstory of any of this, but because you know, in your mind, although. The way- they are saying in the sports circle, they're saying that Jerry West wasn't this angry and wasn't throwing things around, that this is all for dramatic effect. And they're actually okay. saying the guy that wrote the book from Mayapak, an area Jeff by Perlman. me, that he his book is factual, that this show, they've taken some liberties, but still it's entertaining. But they did say Jerry West wasn't like this crazy throwing stuff all around the room. So that's the one I I'm because I've watched a bunch of sports shows like the Rich Eisen show okay. and some other things about this show. Cause again, what's you know what's so good about a TV show like this? Or or it's because it's making me go out and look other things yeah. up later on. And that's what I love about like I'm not doing that with Marvel. Exactly. I'm not doing, I did the I'm same not thing. doing that with Star Wars. I'm doing that with this stuff to see like where is this? I even looked up on that show the Minx because it is. I was like, was this a real magazine that I didn't know about? Like, but no, it's based on on Playgirl. But like, I had to look things up like it may it's causing me to do to get more into it. And again, this Lakers thing, I am so like, I can't wait. Like at nine o'clock, it's going to show up. I'm like, you know, I've, I've been watching the episodes twice. That's how much I love it. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I, I agree. The same thing. And I also started to look up Jerry West a little bit. Like, I never yeah. realized. And I guess he did say at some point, yeah, I had problems with depression and stuff like that. He said as much as, like, an old school uh, athlete will say about mental health. You know, because back in those days, of course, that was a total weakness and you would never do that. So, I, I, yeah, it's a great show. It, everybody everybody should be watching that. Yes. Turn off uh, Spider-Man. <laughs> Just well, give also, up on your comic books for one afternoon, people, please. It, it's so good to see HBO just getting back to something a little more drama, like a little more, I don't know, like a little, I, I guess all I could keep saying is it's, to me, this is what the shows as an adult I want to watch. Listen, I still, I watch 60 Minutes too. I'm not some, you know, which I know, you know, I feel like an old man sometimes watching 60 Minutes, but as you age and as you become an adult, like I, sh- you should be watching a show like the Lakers, you know, like it is. Yeah, it so always much- scares me when people have the same political beliefs and pop culture tastes like at age 15, yeah, at age like, 50. That's that doesn't seem normal. And it just How reminds me of, you know, the reason I had HBO was Sopranos and the wire, you know, like this is a show that is beautifully fit for an HBO. There will be critics, though. There will be people who say, like, well, Brian, you're saying that because you're a cisgender white male and well, HBO damn is right gone I the am, other and way. Guess what? I, I, and how but dare you? Guess what? No, see, I won't because there are like these shows this also have in trouble. I know. But these shows Let's have. Let's talk about man junk. All right. Look, man junk, the new uh, jackass movie. 
streaming on oh, Paramount I, Plus. Oh. So you have Paramount, right? I do because, yeah, it's a long story, but that's how I get my one local news channel here okay, in Okay, because I, I guess I got, I'm going to have to sell out and get that. No, nah, it's probably not worth it, but they do have but the, the offers new, coming up, and I, I really want to see that. They they do have uh, the latest Jackass on there, which I watched, which I, I'll, there, there, are, there are some parts where I was laughing out loud. It was just, there's one, there's one skit thing where they put the guys uh, in a room. They think a snake is in the room. They turn off the lights, and it's... It's very, it's, uh, it's among the funniest okay. things they've ever done. It's just funny. It's three stooges funny, but there's also like, man, there's a lot of man junk. And there's a lot of jokes that center around penises, like just nonstop. And it's, after it's, a while, I'm like, this is really gross. It's 2022, man. It is the year of man junk because again, every I'm show I'm watching, that. every show I'm watching has nudity. Although, Hey, I, <laughs> as the, as the, I'll say this. What I I do like a little bit of a hard R. So hey, listen, I'm all equal rights. If you're gonna show man junk, you're also seeing some other stuff too from the ladies. So you know. Although this, the argument this, there, let me give you the woke argument there is that when you see man junk, it's for comedic purposes, not lustful. And that's the whole. That's the that's sort of the right, well. I the mean, you're never gonna win there. It. Okay. Well. Which all is, right. It kind of makes sense. I'm just. Well, I'm, not, I'm not advocating that. I'm just. I'm just pointing it out because I. I. I don't know. I'm trapped. In I'm the world. sure it's. I know. Not we, we, you read that tourist tax. Oh, well, we're not your usual tourists. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Life just gets dull and uh, nothing like a little variety to spice things up. Right? That's right. You know, Nancy and me, we come from a small town up in Nebraska. And we always have to go someplace else for excitement and variety. You know? Well, tell me, Bart. Uh, just um, what kind of excitement are you looking for? No, me and Nancy, we've been into a lot of things. And we've learned tricks you wouldn't believe. We've been into things like wife swapping and... You married? No, I'm divorced. But remember, three's company and four is definitely proud. <laughs> Man, I am down for anything or anybody. Three's Charles Bronson, the swinger. <laughs> All right, me, you got... Yeah, so that was Charles Bronson being uh, actually he was propositioning uh, another man uh, for a, a threesome with his uh, his wife in the Evil That Men Do, nineteen eighty four. Probably should have won Best Picture. Uh, I guess this is definitely the perverted episode of Insufferable Bastards. It's finally here because uh, the other thing I watched Brian this week on Hulu was Benedetta, the new Benedetta Paul, Paul okay. Verhoeven movie the famous i believe he's a dutch filmmaker he made robocop uh back in the day starship troopers back in the day and a lot of other showgirls total recall showgirls yes and now he's made a movie about a nun i'll give you the plot i'll try to go through it quickly i didn't write any of this down all right so this uh, little girl gets put into the nunnery i don't know if that's actually what they call it uh, by her father because they believe jesus speaks to her directly Right. So the movie's sort of about, well, is Jesus speaking to her or is she sort of a fraud? You know, because she has the stigmata at one point and uh, okay. on her hands. But it's like, wait, did she cut herself? Or like there's this whole sort of debate in the movie as to whether she's a fraud or whether she's genuine. Uh, and then she has, as she grows, she grows uh, older, obviously, into a young woman. She has an affair with a girl who was brought in, like a peasant girl who was just kind of. Her father's gonna. Her father's molesting her. The whole family's molesting her, and the and the nunneries, the nuns take her in. So they have they have this fair, this explicit and sort of uh, sort of uh, in your face. The whole movie, I'll say that this whole movie is in your face. Okay. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, the plague is circulating outside the walls of this thing, and there's conflict between the nun Benedetta, her name is, I believe who may be talking to Jesus and then the, you know, the head mother, the head, whatever that is, the mother superior, mother superior from the blues brothers. So you have all that kind of conflict. So it's, it's batshit crazy. I mean, I don't know anybody, you know, it reminded me and I put this on Twitter, it reminded me of like when Joe Bob Briggs back in the day would host on the movie channel, his Joe you know, the drive-in that he did originally on that or Cinemax when they would suddenly put on, they would throw in like one week, it would be hard ticket to Hawaii on Cinemax. And then the next week it would be like a random Kurt, Kurt, uh, not what's his name? Uh, Ken Russell. 
Okay. So it sort of has that sort of cheesy. It's it's you know it's softcore pornography, but it's it's art. It's somehow it's art. art. Yeah. So I, I felt a little perverted watching it. So anyway, that's the erotic why, is it the erotic thriller now? It's you know well it's not. There's nothing really thrilling or particularly erotic about it. It's just Paul Verhoeven. He's just a weird dude, and it's a weird because I watched. I, all right, here the we go. Adri- I watched the Adrian Lynn erotic thriller on Hulu, uh, with Ben Affleck deep. Deep water, I think it is, or yeah. Wait, deep, I thought that's about the oil oil rig. No, right, is, then it's not deep water; it's deep something, deep place. I don't, I don't even know. It was. I'm going to look it up movie. as you try. I know what you're talking about. You know, it it was anti. It was a horrible. Oh, movie. you're right. It is oh, deep water. Yeah, it's so not erotic, not a thriller, like a really bad movie. And this is who also Adrian just, Lin, right? He came Adrian back? Lin from, uh, you know, the uh, nine and a half weeks and uh, the Godfather and, and of fatal attraction, crappy erotic fillers. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, like, I uh, guess Ben Affleck is a billionaire ish millionaire ish guy who who invented uh, the chip that does uh, drone drone. Uh, you know, the, <laughs> is that at uh, all the, necessary to the plot? Well, I guess because he's a billion, you know, like okay, he's, that's, he's, he's a, just okay. retired and he has a hot young wife who is Anna de Arms I, or something like that. I have no, who, yes, no idea. Yes, that is. yes. I did a movie with her, like one of her first American movies. Um, oh, I'm kidding. But yeah. And it was rated as like one of the worst movies of the year is also starred Keanu Reeves, which I took as a highlight. Like, yes. Hell yeah. The director took his name off the movie. It was so cool. Um, but anyways, it's like she they, she openly cheats on him. You know, it's uh, but it's weird. Like he knows and like, but he's jealous. I I don't know. There's characters like what's that guy? Rel. Uh, he's a comedian. He was in uh, bad the 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 the, the oh, Eric I, Andre. Oh, movie. oh oh uh yeah, Lil Rel Howery. Lil Rel, yeah, he's like a, but he's in the movie as like his best friend, but only in the movie in like one scene. There's another actor, <laughs> uh. Uh, Mish Took or Mish Brock D- D- Dana, like he's a redheaded guy. Dash he was in, uh, Mahook, da- oh, yes. oh, from oh yeah, yeah, he's been in everything. Yeah, he like, looks familiar. He's in the Thin Red Line. Uh, but they're like his best friends, but they're only in one scene. Um, then there's a bunch of boyfriends that you know. Did, I'm uh, looking at this cast. It's like dude, the whole. But it's it's crazy. It makes no sense. It's not sexy. It's not even a good mystery. Because it's all, as far as I know, right there in front of you. Like, I have so many questions. There's a little daughter. The movie ends with the little daughter singing a song in the backseat of a car, which I'm like, what the hell does this even have to do with the freaking movie? I don't know. From what I heard was this movie kind of like, I think it was definitely got pulled from theatrical. And then it just dumped on Hulu. But there's a reason it's dumped. I, I, I would like one somebody in our audience Mainly, probably, please, Shane, will you watch this movie? Because he seems to be the and and tell me what it means and tell me what I missed. It is horrible. Shane's watching. I we should have had Shane on here because he's watching a ton of movies. Like in terms of what we're watching. Yeah, yeah. Shane Shane French is a artist friend of ours who's been on the podcast once or twice before. What about um, what was it? Gone Girl. Ben Affleck did his erotic thriller Gone Girl, which I think is an incredible David Fincher movie. Ben Affleck like this, is is getting, he's getting dangerously close to becoming you know the Bruce Willis just he's he's got another couple of years and then it's going to be Ben Affleck as Bruce Willis as, or as a John lineman Travolta. you know like he changing has electrical highs. things. Oh God, it's it's it, dude, it's so bad. And again, even the eroticism isn't like it's a very tame eroticism. You know, like it, 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 just getting back to that guy, Lil, what's his name, Little Little uh, Rel. Yeah, Little he, he's carving out a real interesting career. It seems like he's doing so many movies, he doesn't have time to finish one movie because he's in Free Guy, the most underwritten performance yeah. where he's Ryan Reynolds' buddy in the in the video game world, but he's barely a character. It seems like they had another one of these things where we had like we have one day with this dude, then he's got to go do a Ben Affleck thriller, and then after that he's going to be a, a seventh build in a Judd Apatow movie. So I don't know. And that like guy's, when I say it's all evidence I, of the Illuminati, according to Twitter, I'm totally getting sucked in by the conspiracy theorists on uh, the uh, uh, Insufferable Bastard Twitter feed, where uh, Zendaya is part of the Illuminati. They're just they're just forcing little Rel and Zendaya on us. They just came out of nowhere. And now they're everywhere. You can't escape them. Oh, I would really. Oh, Zendaya bugs me. 
Yeah, I don't. I yeah. Oh, you well, know what again, I want to say, Brian. Here, here's one thing. I got into a fight, actually, a public fight on my personal uh, Twitter, <laughs> <laughs> which is embarrassing. It's better. I like getting into a fight if I'm under the insufferable bastard's brand. Okay. Because then okay. I can always say, "Oh, that was Brian." If anything ever happens. But uh, all right. So there's this movie called Jackie Brown. Oh yeah. All right. Yeah. So and I put this on Twitter. I just asked the question: Who is the star of Jackie Brown? Mm. Well, you want me to answer it? Yeah. Well, who, just in your opinion. Yeah. If I asked you that question, which I just did, who would you say? Oh. Well, I'd say Pam Greer. Pam Greer. What well, if you had a, if you had okay, Pam? You can't say Pam Greer. Who would you say right. after that? Robert Foss, Robert Forrester. How about after that? No, you can't. You can't say who's the star of Jackie Brown. You can't say Pam Greer or Robert Forrester. And then I'll then I'll go into my fight. Uh, Sam Jackson. Yeah, okay, so there was this headline the other day. I got to find it. It was from uh, the playlist, which has become like just a sort of, I mean, they must be struggling for money because all their posts now, the playlist is just, uh, here's the ending of The Mist Explained. If you didn't get The Mist ending, here it is explained in this oh, yeah. clickbait. Okay. Yeah, they're just kind of circling the drain. It used to be kind of a good site, but they had a headline. I'm not going to be able to find it now because they just post so much. They had a headline saying how Quentin Tarantino got Michael Keaton to star in Jackie Brown. What? How they got, yeah, how Quentin Tarantino. I think I saw, I saw this headline I didn't read because I'm like, he's not. He's not. I, yeah, so I just went on there and I don't know why. You know, we should all just get off social media. It's, it's destroying democracy. It's tearing apart families. Uh, it tore apart. Like I had, I had two friends. I lost one of them. <laughs> primarily because of social media but i put in the comment thread i just put the word i just, oh here it is i finally found it i just said star with a question mark the headline was how quentin quentin tarantino convinced michael keaton to star in jackie brown and, he's in two scenes well yeah maybe three right so i was just like I, I i just took exception with the use of the word star in the context of that headline nothing against michael keaton when we talked about you you sang the praises of dope sick before yeah. anybody then i went and saw it and we were all like dope sick dope sick dope sick michael keaton gives the best performance anywhere in the show dope sick but like these random people like get on there and the things they said were just, they just blew my mind. Oh, maybe the guy, maybe the guy erased it all. Uh, well, also, what was the other movie? It was uh, Out of Sight, right? That's, he's the same character as in Out of Sight. I forgot about that. Yeah, the Elmore Leonard stuff. Because it's it's just an Elmore Leonard character. He's a cameo in Jackie Brown. Right. He's a, he's fifth build in the movie. Like, the, uh, my point was the headline could have said, and in and, and Slash Film, when they, posted this to facebook right they had a link to their article and the the headline the erroneous headline was displayed but in their own description of the article the website itself said quentin tarantino had to fight an uphill battle when it came to convincing michael keaton to join jackie brown and i was like yeah join to be yeah. in you could yeah. use a hundred other phrasings aside from star because he's not the star he's fifth build by definition he's not the star of jackie brown and i'll be honest dude he's probably only fifth build because of his He's name. name exactly exactly you know? all right so we're on the same thing this guy i want maybe should i say all right well bill vela v-e-l-a that's how you phrase it you wouldn't say guest starring unless it's unless it's a television role actors star in movies you must be new this is guy now insulting me <laughs> no see that's not true because they've done that uh and i mean like, you could say He's then a he's supporting like, cast member. He's like, give it up. You tried to hate on Keaton. Didn't take. He starred in Jackie Brown along with Forster, Greer, De Niro, Fonda, and Jackson. And I'm just, I, you know, so then I just started to say like, oh, yes. And, and, he, and uh, the other star of Jackie Brown is, of course, Chris Tucker. Name the star of True Romance. Yeah. Val Kilmer. Who starred in Pulp Fiction? Kathy Griffin. <laughs> Let's talk about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and its star, Lena Dunham. Like there is also just, here's another argument. Reservoir the, Dogs star dog starring Edward Bunker. Yeah, I mean, I could get you could say Robert Forster or, or or Pam Greer. I'm totally fine with that if if, the, if either of those two were in that. But I'm it just in this just in terms of accuracy of a headline, it's completely wrong, and it just blew my mind that 
somebody and, and this is like one or two people were just like defending I'm like come on where's the logic there star anyway that's i just wanted to get my revenge on that dude by blasting him on my podcast that 16 people <sighs> listen to treasure to me i love judge oh, dread oh. i absolutely love judge dread so i guess that's that anything else you wanted to add that's brian that. i'm sorry no, i went on a rant there at the end no but. that's it like uh i'm anxiously looking forward to the the new episode tonight for the lakers and uh i'm just looking for uh, something other than what i've been watching these fucking superhero movies all right so with and that- i won't be watching the oscars how's that because yeah, I don't, I, have, I haven't seen any, movie, you know, I saw I, Licorice Pizza. I want to see that. Uh, yeah. I mean, I saw Dune. I, I thought Dune was a, was, a, oh, yeah, was Dune. a movie. It was entertaining. It was, it wasn't a whole movie. It was half a movie, but I've, I, yeah, I've seen nothing. And I like, I'm at the point where God bless the Oscars. I just, I just don't care. I mean, I, I think it's well, cool. I saw some headlines thing. saying like uh, Samuel L. Jackson got an honorary thing and Denzel Washington was very excited. I thought that was heartwarming. You know, uh, the whole controversy about what's getting put on. I mean, I don't, who cares? Well, it bothers me because the category that would be my job is no longer televised. No, and I'm like, screw the Oscars. Yeah, I, it's, I have just no interest. I mean, for years now, I just, I stopped oh, watching. Oh, I agree with ago. you. Yeah. They're never, t- in my opinion, they're never the best movies. I mean, it's just, you nope. know. Anyway, all right. So that's that. That's our Oscar telecast. It's our perverted Oscar telecast. <laughs> so I don't know when we'll see you again. We're going to try to record next week. I'm going to record. I'm going to edit this. I'm not edit this. I'm going to release this unedited. And uh, I guess we'll see you when you when we see you. Goodbye. Later. to me i love judge oh, dread oh. i absolutely love judge dread i meant to play the fart actually but i messed up <laughs>